On today's Join Us in France, tour the Southwest with Annie and Elise. This is Join Us in France, episode 147. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise about some of the places that we are going to visit on our upcoming tour of the southwest of France. My thanks to the listeners who signed up to support the show on Patreon this week, Nancy Colliard and Alexander Schraff. Thank you so much, Nancy and Alexander, for becoming patrons of the show. You can support the show on Patreon for as little as $5 per month or the price of, you know, a, a coffee, I guess. If you go to Starbucks, it might not even buy you a whole big coffee. <laughs> it depends. But anyway, it's pretty inexpensive and it really helps out. There is also uh, exclusive content for patrons. Last week, I released a new installment of Lunch Break French, the monthly French language comprehension challenge for Patreon supporters. This is fairly advanced spoken French. I enunciate uh, clearly. You can follow along in French as well as read the translation. But this is intended for people who are to the point where they've got the basic French down. They just need to progress a little bit. There are plenty of other great resources to get you started in French. The very easiest one is called Duolingo. It's an app that you can install on your phone. It's free. On the Join Us in France Facebook group, we've discussed this this very week. Uh, the people really like Coffee Break French, I think it's called. But I'm assuming that all of these things are fairly... They're for beginners. The other place that I recommend you go to is um, Laura K. Lawless. I think it's called Lawless French. And it's very good. It's very, very good because she's good at explaining French grammar. She's, a, she's an American, American-born, but has lived in France for a long time. And she, she's very good at explaining grammar. So... So anyway, so that's ready for you. And also the first extended show notes that I promised last week, they're written and they're ready to go, but I'm stuck on how to uh, distribute this. So give me a couple, a couple more days. It'll be out soon. These extended show notes are kind of an addendum to the, to the show because I obviously I create a post that goes along with every episode. And if you want to see the one for this episode, you need to go to join us in France dot com forward slash one four seven the number one four seven and on the show notes I give you usually I give you timestamps and also a brief description of what we talked at that point in the show so that you can see stuff written down if we mention places uh, names things in French I always write them down for you but the extended show notes go beyond that. So they are a faithful rendition of everything that we said. It's not an actual transcript because an actual transcript would be unpleasant to read. I mean, if I had to include all the times where we start talking about something and then we switch back and then we never get back to it and then we, you know, it'd be awfully confusing, which we do in normal, natural conversation. So what I do in the extended show notes is I give you all the timestamps, I give you a good summary, a faithful summary of what we said. And I also add things that maybe we forgot to mention at the time. Because every time I do show notes, I, I start Googling stuff. I'm, I make sure I'm spelling it right. I make sure that I've got the right address. And when I Google stuff, every time, it doesn't matter how long we talk, I always come up with things. Oh, we should have mentioned this and we should have mentioned that. And so those things go in the extended show notes. And that's a perk for you to support the show on Patreon. 
But I do ask you not to share these extended show notes because eventually I would like to turn them into a proper guidebook about specific regions. Thank you very much for your support, Patreon supporters. If you too want to join the Patreon support, go to patreon.com forward slash join us. And that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And join us. It doesn't have any dashes or spaces or anything. Thank you, thank you very much. And all of you who have been supporting the show for several months now, thank you for your continued support. If you like this episode, you should also check out episode 43 on Saint-Cirque-la-Popie and episode 62 on Cahors in the Lot, which we, we will also visit on the Southwest Tour. As you can see, we're not stingy. I mean, on this episode, we are telling you about the tour because we hope you'll be interested and want to book it. But if you don't want to book it, if you want to go by yourself, that's fine too. We give you all the same information. Uh, it's just that if you come along with us, you'll have more fun because we're fun. <laughs> Let's face it. Okay. To uh, learn about any of our uh, tour offerings, we don't have that many, but uh, go to addictedtofrance.com. Com. On a little bit of a personal note, uh, today I'm, uh, I'm recording this on Easter Sunday and I'll spend most of the day today at Elise's with my family and hers, And but we'll just be hanging out. No, not talking about, uh, join, well, we'll probably talk about Join Us in France, but, but no recording an episode or anything like that. And tomorrow I'll get to celebrate again with my family and my siblings because in France we get Easter Monday as well. It's, we're a very secular country, but uh, we love our religious holidays. And so we take them off. It's, uh, the, the country is going to, everything is going to be closed. Well, most things are going to be closed. And in France, it's the bells that bring the chocolate, not the bunnies. <laughs> uh, and our bells come from Rome, obviously, for obvious, obvious reasons. And, and I hope they have good taste in the chocolate this year. I'm starting to see the rapeseed fields, you know, the deep yellow crop. They use it to uh, to make canola oil. They're in bloom right now. It's just so beautiful, so lovely. I need to uh, go out and take more f photos of that. And I also invite you to connect with me and with the Join Us in France community. We're a great group of people who know a lot about France and like to share about it and share our experiences. To join that community, go to Facebook and search for Join Us in France closed group. I will also put a link on the show notes. All right, let's talk about a few of the wonderful places we'll go to on our upcoming Southwestern tour. This is Join Us in France, episode 147. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And Join Us in France is a show all about French things. French. <laughs> How you been, Elise? Well, I guess I've been okay. Yes? Yeah. Yeah? Well, we've been doing a lot of talking about our trips and the things we're planning and That's everything. Right. So that makes me happy. Yes, we've been at this all afternoon, uh, planning the Paris trip coming up in uh, May, May 14th through, through the 21st. 21st. We still have four spots left for Four that. spots so left. If somebody wants them, they're right there on Addicted to France for you to grab. But, but we're also planning another tour because we're crazy people. <clears throat> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> And this other tour is going to be a Southwest tour. Yes. Home sweet home. Home sweet home. <laughs> so this tour is going to be... Are you ready to announce the date? Ta -ta -ta. <laughs> this tour is going to be from September 9th through September 17th of this year, 2017. Yeah. That's right. And we are going to be doing a lot of fun things. So we are going to obviously start with Toulouse. Uh, bien sûr. <laughs> because it's the nicest city in the Southwest. It is one of the nicest cities in France. And in Toulouse, of course, some of the classics... My favorite, it has been a favorite of mine since I was a young child, since I was born and raised here, 
is uh, Saint Sernin, la basilique Saint Sernin, which is a as a church. It is a church, a World UNESCO Heritage Site already. Mm -hmm. um, the church itself, it's a church from the 12th century, so it's it's absolutely exquisite. It's beautiful, and we are going to go to Saint Raymond, the museum, the museum, which is an archaeology museum that is filled with wonderful, beautiful things that tell the story of Toulouse and its 2,000 year history. Yeah, long time. It's been here a long time. It feels like I've been here a long time. Not quite 2,000 years, but... <laughs> Almost. You've been here. <laughs> Almost. I mean, you, you, you weren't born in Toulouse, at least, but you were, you've been living here for an awful long time. I have. Yes, How indeed. Long? Right now, I've been living here for 20 years. Wow. That's a long time. And, um, and we'll also go to see uh, Aeroscopia, which is uh, Airbus. Airbus and the new museum that has the history of aviation. And even for somebody who is the total non-technological human being like yours truly, it was so much fun. Yeah, that museum is fun. And visiting the... the Airbus. The factory, the yeah. Airbus factory where they put together the right. A380 yes. is absolutely fantastic to see. You got to see this. It's very, very fun. We'll also go explore all sorts of things about Pierre-Paul Riquet, the, the engineer who put together the uh, Canal du Midi. The Canal du Midi, right. And of course, don't forget, we will do, of course, a walking tour of just getting a good look at the old city center of Toulouse, which of is course, really absolutely course. beautiful. Yes, of course. Yeah. I, I'm not listing everything. I'm just right. uh, talking about a few of the highlights. This tour will also take you to Carcassonne. Carcassonne, yes. Yes, lovely walled city of Carcassonne. Also a world UNESCO heritage site. Yep. The beautiful, colorful, medieval town of Mirepoix. Mm -hmm. With its magnificent uh, half-timbered colored houses, uh, very famous for how beautiful it is and how well-preserved it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's a very nice one, that one. Very nice one. Mirepoix is, a, yeah, it's, it's just beautiful. We will go to Albi. Yes, Albi, another beautiful church. But not and just that, Toulouse-Lautrec. The famous Toulouse-Lautrec Museum. In uh, a yeah. beautiful building, and uh, the old city center of Albi is actually also a world UNESCO heritage site now yes, since is. 2010. Yeah. yeah, now we'll go to Corde, Corde. sur Ciel. Yes, beautiful place, famous we'll medieval village on top of a piece of rock. Yeah, you will go to Lille sur Tarn. See a Bastide, we'll tell you what that is. The Bastide, yes. Uh, le Château de Sceaux. Ooh, get to taste some nice Gaillac wines. Yes, lovely Gaillac wines. We will, um, part of the time, you will stay at a beautiful, beautiful um, Toulousaine house. And the Toulousaine is a specific style of house. It's made of brick. And it's got, um, well... It's got a lot of history, so I'll, I'll have to tell you yeah. when you're here, because I, right. if I go into that now, we'll never get to the episode. But it's it's a beautiful, beautiful place where you will spend, I think, four, four nights. Four nights? I think it's four nights, yeah. And this place also has a pool and a lovely place, a lovely terrace to have aperitif every night. It'll be absolutely fantastic. And we'll have a cooking class there, too. So uh, one afternoon, we'll fix our dinner together and enjoy it together. We'll probably also do a little bit of French class uh, where I'll try to speak French with you. See what, see what happens. <laughs> see which one of you <laughs> follows me. But it's okay because we'll do it at this lovely place where if you're not interested, you can just go to the pool, right? <laughs> yeah, you can just go stick your head under the water. Exactly. Uh, you don't need to learn any French to learn if you anything. don't want to. Yeah. I'm a little bit afraid that you're going to ask me difficult grammatical questions because that's not my forte. I mean, I did teach French in college in the U.S., but I mean, I'm not saying I'm old or anything, but it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, it was never my forte. Like, you know, most of the time you ask me, why do you say it this way in French and not that way? Well, I'm going to tell you because it sounds better. I, you know, I, I don't really know the reasons. It's just the way we say it, right? And by now... Well, I'm shaking my head because, of course, I've taught English for years and years and years living in France. And um, the trouble is that there are certain things where there is no real reason, but then, of course, there are other things where there is a there reason. Is. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, you do yeah. have to know it. But yeah. I understand it's the kind of like, I don't really care about the grammar, but you just need, you need to know this is how it goes. Right. right. And, and in French, I don't know the grammar as well. I know it better in English. 
yeah. because I learned English as a second language. language. Right. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we'll do some of that. And we also, I just remembered, we're looking at the list here. We're going to go and spend a day in the lot. Yes. And see one of my most favorite places, which is... Uh, Kaor and the Lot River and the village of Saint Sacre Poupie. Yes, we did an epi- We did a whole episode oh, on Saint Sacre Poupie. So beautiful. I can't yeah. remember the episode number. Oh, it's an early one. Yes, and it's lovely, 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 lovely. Yeah. Yes, and for this tour, we will have. So this is a. This is going to be an even smaller tour than the yes. Paris tour, because it's going to be all in one big van that I'm going to drive. She's going to drive. I'm going to talk. She's going to talk. <laughs> but I'm I'm a I'm an excellent driver. She is. <laughs> Most of the time. Yes. And so I'll be doing the driving and so it limits us as to the number. So we can have seven guests. So this this tour is going to be sold as uh three rooms with double occupancy and one single. So you know everything just Consider it September 9th through the 17th. And it's a beautiful time to be in the southwest of France. Oh, yeah, it's the best time of it's year. It's still warm and sunny, but it's not the horrible heat of the real summer. Summer, And it's a lovely time to be down And here. you won't believe the food. I mean, the, the food in the southwest, as I've been telling you all for a long time now, is the best in France. I know people in Burgundy think, Theirs is better. Oh, it's much richer. It's, but it's, it's heavier. Yeah, it's heavier, it's heavier and it's yeah. not as original. No. And I'm sorry. Provence is pretty good. Provence? Provence is pretty good. Yeah, Provence, yeah. I have to hand it yeah. to them. They're, they have good food too. But, but the we, Southwest, like, I You know, really look, love. we are in a region that produces a huge amount of fruit and mm-hmm. a lot of vegetables. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have all of that stuff coming almost locally and especially at that time of the year. You yeah. Know, so it's really great. And ducks. And ducks. Ducks, ducks. ducks. Ducks, ducks, and wine, yes. and wine, <laughs> and so, good bread. So it'll be fun. Oh, God, is it getting to be dinner time already? <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Almost. So today, Elise, we are not going to just talk about this tour. We are going to talk about... Uh, we're going to talk about what uh, one of the day's itinerary, actually, mm, mm, because mm, mm. Uh, it was something that I actually had wanted to do anyway, for those people who don't know the southwest of France, it's a region that is probably the region of France that is the richest in old, beautiful medieval villages. And there are zillions of them that are absolutely gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole section of them that goes up basically uh, north and I would say like northeast uh, of Toulouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we kind of worked out an itinerary to go stop in a few of these on the same day yep and it takes us through the Gayak wine country at first and then up into these lovely hills which wind up getting actually fairly steep because it's a region that has a lot of limestone cliffs and we will eventually be passing uh, uh, the river of Aveyron and it's gorgeous um uh, The gorges are gorgeous. (laughs) Um, And uh, we'll be going in this area. It's it's one of my most favorite areas within an hour or so of Toulouse. Yeah. That's one of the things. It's not that far. It's really not that far. Right. By the time we end the day, we will be a bit further away. Mm -hmm. But uh, we just thought it would be a lovely thing to do. And it's a perfect time of year to do it because you won't even have, hopefully, the haze of summertime or anything else. There are some spots will be where you have a great point of view and it's a really wonderful thing to do. Yeah. So uh, we're going to start out in... uh, taking in this road that goes winding up uh, kind of through wine country and then comes out on this very lovely small country road. And it takes us to the first stop, which is a village called Puy-Celsi. 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 Yes. And uh, it, it's, it's one of those places, when I first saw it, the first time I saw it was probably about 15, 16 years ago, one day just kind of driving around in the area. I literally just fell in love with it. It Mm -hmm. was one of those things where it was like, I've seen a lot of villages, a lot of beautiful villages with medieval houses and everything. And I just went, I love this place. And sorry that I am, poor that I am. (laughs) At the time that I first saw it, half of the houses in this village, which is perched up on top of a promontory at about 
250 meters high, so it's really high up. Yeah. Half of the village houses at the time were abandoned and uninhabited. Oh, wow. And now there is not one. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. 30% of the people who live in this village are foreigners. Oh, wow. Actually, That's a lot. it's a lot. A lot of Americans, believe it or not, hmm. um, Belgians and uh, people who have made some of these houses into summer homes. Hmm. So it's a village that unfortunately is not very populated during the winter. Right. It's only got a population of less than about 200 people in the mm-hmm. winter time, mm-hmm. but in the summer is absolutely bustling. So what makes this town so special? And, um, I mean, when we won't be going in the summer, summer, but this no. early September, it's coming. everything's there. Everything's there. Yeah. It's still, everything's wide yeah. open. And, yeah. And, and the fact is that even though it doesn't have that much of a permanent population, it has two restaurants that are open all year round. And it has a very lovely small little hotel and a and b and things like that. So there is a life to this village. Mm-hmm. It's in the countryside. Uh, we're talking about villages that are really in the countryside. Right. Uh, but not flat countryside. And so like uh, the other villages on the same itinerary, uh, these are all villages that exist for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the documentation for pre Celsi goes back to the 1100s. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it is a circular village up on top of this huge rocky cliff. Annie's looking at me. I'm waving my arms. And I'm, trying, <laughs> I'm trying to show everybody out there what I'm talking about. It's, it's really impressive because just, you take this very small, narrow road and you drive up to the bottom of the ramparts and you can, if it's not a crowded day, you can drive and park all the way up at the top. And if not, you have to figure out where down below you park. And then there's a path that kind of helps you kind of zig and zag your way all the way up to the top. But one of the things that I remember that made me so love this village from the beginning was that it is very unusual to have a village that has a 360 degree view over the land around it. Yeah, that's got to be really pretty. And Puisselsi does. It's uh, an old fortified village. Most of the walls on one side are destroyed. It still has part of its walls and ramparts on another side. There's a gate that you can go through. But otherwise, you can just kind of walk up and or even drive up to the top. And uh, it's just beautiful. It's filled, filled, filled with beautiful homes from the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s. And as they say, most of them have been nicely fixed up. Yeah. Well, and it's the really thing is, if you, if you think about what did people live like back then, well, the lucky ones who could be in a beautiful village like that, that's how they lived, mm-hmm. in, in a place like that, you that's know? That's right. Uh, they they weren't that different from us, really. They, you know, they wanted to be safe and uh, in a in a nice place. And they built up. And and it is true what you were saying. It, it is very true that of course we're talking about a long time ago. We're talking about a, really eight hundred years ago or more. Uh, people who lived in a village were already more or less okay financially because they were craftspeople, tradespeople. Yes. And it was the very poor who lived outside in huts and things like that yeah. in the. 1100s, 1200s. And then, of course, this is one of the things that makes Puisselsi very, very famous too now is that it is uh, situated at the southern end of one of the most beautiful forests in the southwest, Mm. and that is the forest of Grésigne. And uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit because it's connected to the history of all of the towns that we're going to do on that day because... Now you can go, and I have done this, you can drive to the entrance to the forest. There's a big parking lot area. And they have these magnificent walks through the forest. Yeah. And it's, it's a mixed forest. It's a forest that has deciduous trees and some, you know, pine trees or whatever, those kinds of, you know, evergreen type trees. Um, but it has lovely trails. Mm-hmm. And the history of the forest is very much connected to the history of uh, Puiselsi and, and another village that, that we'll see afterwards. Because uh, for centuries, it was a royal forest. It actually belonged to the king. And because it was a royal forest, they actually built a wall around it. This is a forest that is uh, over, I did the calculation, it comes to 8,000 acres. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, so they didn't want people going in. They didn't want people going in. Why? Because there's a special oak tree that grows in this forest that is a very slow-growing oak 
that's called the uh, Chen Rouvre. Okay. And that... R-O-U-V-R-E. Okay. It was used to make ships. Okay. And so, uh, starting with Louis XIII, and then particularly... I thought you were going to say truffles. Oh, God. I thought you were going to say truffles grew under that. Yeah, well, I, they grow under Because they do. It. I mean, truffles grow under oak trees. They do, but I wasn't talking about what grows okay, under okay. them. I was okay. talking about the trees. <laughs> the trees themselves. The trees themselves. Seriously, under Louis XIV and Louis XV and Louis XVI, you could be executed if you chopped down a tree. That sounds like... Um... Oh, what's the name of that book? Uh, Victor Hugo book? No, 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 no. Uh, what? While she's thinking, I'll continue talking. And now, what there is, besides this fabulous forest, which still, of course, exists, but now is no longer a royal forest with a wall around it, there is a conservatory that is an experimental agricultural center on the edge of it that works on varieties, new varieties and ancient varieties of apples and pears. So as you know, Annie, that puts me into probably a state of seventh heaven. You would like that, yes. <laughs> Just talk to me about apples and pears, anybody out there, and you will make me smile, right? Yes, yeah, she it's, likes the stuff. I love this kind of stuff. So it's very beautiful. Uh, and the story of it being a royal forest is really very serious because it was used, it was considered to be the very finest oak wood that could be used to make the ships, which of course the kings used to go out and either bring things back from some foreign port or go and make war with their friendly neighbors, the Spanish or the Germans. As you do. Or the English. Yes. Right, yes, right. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, um, these towns, these villages uh, that follow this particular road, uh, all of them have the same basic history. That is, at the time of uh, the war with the Qatar which is this religious war that has a lot to do with the history of the southwest of France and Carcassonne. We talked about it when we talked about Carcassonne and I think a little bit about Toulouse. Every single one of these villages was a Qatar holdout. And so it was attacked by the king's uh, forces at the time and mm. was taken. And so these towns are towns where there's a long, long history of resistance. So part of that I think has to do with the fact that uh, they're all perched high up somewhere on mm -hmm. some kind of cliff. And it gives them a kind of protective insularity. You know, they yeah. want to defend themselves and nobody's going to tell them what to do. I think that had something to do with the mentality. Yeah. Um, and this particular town, Puisselsi, still has part of the royal castle that was built that is now actually somebody's private home. Would you believe this? Mm. But was... Part of what happened when the French army actually conquered the town, they didn't kill anybody or they killed very few people. They just took it over because the traitor that he was, the half-brother of the Count of Toulouse, Raymond VI, who was the great defender of the Qatar, he had a half-brother named Baudouin mm -hmm. who was very jealous of him and who wanted to be the Count of Toulouse. And so what did he do? He sided with the French against his brother and against the Qatar and against the Albigeois and all the people fighting to preserve their independence. And he gave the city over to the French. He got his... Stinking. He got his punishment. Oh, he, he did? He got his punishment. Good. Because... What happened? Several what years. nail did they rip out? <laughs> Well, they, did, they, did, they did more than that. Oh. Four years later, mm. he was taken prisoner yeah. by Raymond the Sixth, yeah, and executed for treason. Ah, well, there you go. So there you are. Yes. Don't do things like that. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do things like that. Right. Okay. The book I wasn't remembering is the Hunger Games. Oh. In the Hunger Games, oh, they put fences around around the forest, and if you get ah. caught hunting in the forest or you're taking right. stuff, you get in big trouble. Absolutely, you're right. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yes. Well, of course, in in the early and middle medieval times, uh, forests and property basically belonged to the king and yeah. to the royals, yeah. and so you weren't allowed to pretty much do anything. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just you had to either pay for it or they had to give you permission. But imagine that you actually could have been executed for just 
a chopping tree. down one tree in this forest. In Dang. this particular forest. It was famous for years and years and years. Huh. And then, interestingly, too, in, in the period of the 15 and 1600s, when you have in France the war of religion between the Protestants and the Catholics, a lot of Protestants moved to out of the big cities to these small villages that were kind of remote and hidden away. Yeah. And uh, some of them took up glass making. And this is true also in the Massif Central and in, in a lot of the areas uh, north and northeast uh, of Toulouse. Mm -hmm. And they became what is uh, called gentlemen glass makers because they were mostly people from upper middle class families who were very, very uh, cultivated, but who ran away to go hide in the forest so that they wouldn't be caught because they wanted to keep their Protestant religion. Hmm. And so for five centuries, all the glassmakers were the people who were like that. Hmm. And they're apparently, I haven't seen it yet. I've been, I've done walks in this forest a few times, but apparently there are a couple of places in the forest where there are vestiges of where they actually lived. Nice. It's kind of an interesting area, you know? Yeah. It's very rural uh, it's, it has nothing to do with city life and yet it's so, so filled with history and it's beautiful. It's just absolutely yeah. beautiful. And from one of the places up above at the top of the village, you have a, a view of the beginning of the gorges of the Aveyron river. And that's mm -hmm. of course will take us further North and to a rear, an area that's really spectacular, you know? Nice. Nice. So that's our first stop on this day. Yes. And our second stop is, and then she cracks the whip and I have to drive again. You like driving. I guess I, I, have to buy, I, I have to buy you something, like what, a coffee, a couple of coffee. Oh, there's a wonderful little store in the middle of pre C where it's like a miniature grocery store, but the guy makes his own cookies. Oh. And they are so delicious. Oh, nice. Look at the things that I remember from visits, you know. <laughs> you really know where my interests lie. You remember lie. the cookies. Yes, I remember the cookies and the apples, you know. It's like, <laughs> this is my thing. Not the meat and the foie gras. Really, no. 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 Um, <laughs> anyway, I'll have to get you some cookies. Okay, all And right. a nice coffee at the beautiful place that's a really yeah. wonderful terraced coffee place right in nice. the middle of Puy Celci. Nice. So it's really nice. And there's a beautiful uh, church that's from the 1300s that's really interesting to to see on the inside and and it's small right right i mean these are these are villages this is that, a village it's, it's a village you know, nothing is going to no. be the size no. of notre dame i mean no you but know. it's so wonderfully filled with history and since everyone has a certain pride in where they are they take good care of everything so yeah. it's very lovely to see it yeah. really is yeah. so then after we do our visit to pre sea yeah which probably does include a very nice little coffee stop mm -hmm. um we go up uh, further up the road, another just about 15 or so kilometers, which is not very far. No. And we get to another very famous uh, village called Brunichel. Brunichel. Eh oui, Brunichel. Yes. So then we get to Brunichel. Yes. Which is also spectacular. And by the way, both Brunichel and Puisselcy are part of this group of villages called Les Plus Beaux Villages de France. Yes. Which is really a very, very prestigious label because there is a list of things that the village must have, and that includes uh, restoring all the old historical buildings, have flowers everywhere, have mm -hmm. clean streets. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes these villages really beautiful. They to are visit. beautiful. They and, are very beautiful. But, but they are villages. So, like I was uh, mentioning to um, somebody on the close group, sometimes. They are a bit empty. But again, yeah. since we're going in September right. and the weather is going to be lovely for sure because September in Toulouse is beautiful. the best time of year, really. It's, it's absolutely best. It's not as hot, and it's but it's still lovely. You still have a lot of flowers. Yeah. It's gorgeous. So um, since we'll go at that time of year, it's not going to be empty. There's no, no, no. We won't be the only ones there. No, we won't be know? the only ones there. And these the, the cafe and the restaurant and the little store will be open. I mean, yeah. these are things that will be available to, to give you a sense of some of the life in it. It, but know. it's true that sometimes but you go small. to these villages and it's like, yeah. oh, that's right. it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Except that some of the villages... Now, now, interestingly enough, puy sur really doesn't have a very big population as a year-round population. Right. But in the summer, of course, it triples, right? Right. Now, Brunichel is actually bigger. Uh, Brunichel mm. is bigger. And one of the other differences is that um, even though puy sur we're we're in stone country. You know, Toulouse is brick country. We're going to be going into uh, a part of the region that has everything old built out of stone. 
But the stone in pre Celsi is kind of mixed in the kind of stone it is and everything. When you get to Brunekel, the stone is amazingly white. Huh. It's very, very, very white. It's very much more flashy, kind of limestoney looking. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just it's just amazing. And where Pui Celsi is a, a village uh, is in the round. Um, Brunekel is also a village that is built high up on a cliff, but it's, it's long. I it's, see. it's like, it's like almost on a ridge, maybe it's on a ridge, but it's cantilevered. So you have oh. to go up a bunch of steps and then the first streets, uh, that go, uh, horizontally, are there with houses and then you go up some more steps and then you have another street with beautiful uh, medieval houses and then you go through this archway that has this old uh, medieval clock and you keep doing this and basically how many the, steps is that i don't know but there are a bunch of steps to go up to the top it's it's steep uh, mm-hmm. whereas puis el c it's it's steep to get up to the top but once you're in the village it's more or less more or less flat so mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about mm-hmm. too much going up and down brunichel is really different. Brunichel is a town where it is very much up and down because of the way it was constructed. But what makes it even more fascinating is that its history goes back much further even than pre Celsi because it is called Brunichel because there is the remains of a very, very ancient fortified chateau that was probably started in the 600s. Oh my. And you can visit it. It's actually visitable. Uh, and I've done that too. It's really kind of neat to go in because they've restored a little bit of it. And the rest of it is kind of ruins, but it's fun to walk through and see. And it was the home of one of the first Merovingian queens named Ooh. Brunehild. Ah. Which is why this town is called Brunekel. Because it's named after her. Brunehilde. Brunehilde. And she was, I, did, I was doing a lot of reading about her because, God, she was a really interesting woman. First of all, she lived to the age of 65. We're talking about in the 600s. Yeah. We're talking about a long time ago. They had no meds, man. They didn't, <laughs> not only didn't they have any meds, but everybody was killing everybody else off. Yeah. And this is the earliest <laughs> Frankish population okay so the franks of course are the people who gave the name france to the country yeah uh they were uh, originally invading populations coming basically from northern germanic areas yeah uh but there were two different sets of groups you know there were first the merovingians and then there were the carolingians because of the ruler that they had so the first ruler was a man named merove Okay. That's, that's how the this. That's, that's why it's, that's why it's called Merovingian. Merovi, yeah. And they were around for about 150 years, and um, to be honest, I don't really know what happened because they were cousins with the others. But then somehow they did. I think part of what happened was that the 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 rulers were so much into infighting and killing each other off <laughs> that eventually uh, one of the cousins started uh, his invasion in the further south part of France and uh, that was the the group that eventually led to Charlemagne and Charlemagne who is actually the man who made France into a country and made the whole area into an empire he was around in the late 700s yeah so we're talking about 150 almost 200 years of of difference but they were all the franks these were the people that were franks but so she was married she was a princess and she was married off to one of the sons of merove or one of his grandsons and the story is that basically just like in a shakespeare play she outlived her husband one and husband two Mm-hmm. She outlived her son. She outlived her grandson. Dang. Who actually wound up taking control of the whole region, uh, which, of course, is part of the southwest. Not Aquitaine, but the, each, the region closer to wh- where we are. Occitania. Occitania. But yeah. southern part of Occitania, because Occitania was actually much bigger. It included a lot of other parts, too. Right, right. It was more like the Quercy and uh, the Rueg and all these areas yeah. like that. Okay. And she uh, eventually, believe it or not, was killed by her great-grandson. Killed by her <laughs> great-grandson. How's very that? Ni- not it's very awful, nice. Awful, awful. But anyway... I guess you didn't get a good enough Christmas present? Yeah, well, <laughs> it must have been something like that. It really must have been something <laughs> like that. She was too 
intelligent and two powerful and long live intelligent and powerful women. But she managed to make it that long. And she built some chateaus in different little villages in uh-huh. the region that she was basically controlling because she was really the power for a long time. And one of them was this incredible chateau. And when we go there and when you get up to the top, when you look out, it's built onto the edge of the uh, promontory. You look down and it's this sheer drop straight down on one side of the castle. And it was for purely protective defensive sure, purposes. Sure. You know? yeah. So that was one of her castles. And uh, it turns out that like the other village that we have talked about, Cord. Yeah, Cord sur Ciel, yes. Brunichel in the middle Middle Ages, like around the year 1000 and 1100, 1200, became super, super rich and very, very affluent and had up to 5,000 people, if you can imagine. When you see this, it's hard to believe because of textiles and because they did a lot of tanning. Okay. So they had a place down below near the water. Not tanning booths. No, not those kinds of tanning. <laughs> no, for leather. And they did work. They wove li- linen and hemp. And their uh, cloth was considered some of the finest in the Middle Ages. So people came from far, far, far away. Hey, people still pay good money for hemp cloth. Yep. And <laughs> she is out of her mind. Go eat another piece of chocolate. Yeah. But anyway, it's a fabulous village to, to, to visit, and it's filled are with... Are you sure we're going to have to climb up all those stairs? I might have to do some exercising first. Yeah, we are. Can't drive up somehow and drop you off? No. I'll try. No. <laughs> no. The parking lot stops down below, uh, right where the steps begin. Huh. <laughs> you can take it slow. There's a couple of cafes right at the bottom where the steps are. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But... It's really fabulous to see. We just know you have to take it easy and take it slow. But it's also famous for being one of the villages with one of the largest uh, collection of preserved houses from the 1300s and 1400s. That Uh, sounds good. It's really, really beautiful. You know, I don't remember. I mean, I I haven't looked at pictures of it. Uh, I've probably been because I've been to all these villages. But I just don't remember, you know. Well, sometimes I go to a place like that and I go, oh, I've totally been here before. I just forgot. Yeah, (laughs) that that could be. But it, it it is rather spectacular. And I must say, to be very honest... It is also uh, something you don't really forget because of all the stairs. <laughs> no. yeah. You know, it, they're in the center. I have been to plenty of places with lots of stairs. But so. the thing about it is that the way it's situated, see, unlike Cord, which is in concentric circles that you go up to the top yeah. on, okay? Even Puy-Celsi. This one is very, very, very horizontal. And the stairs with the ancient uh, entrance way are dead center in the middle yeah, of this yeah, horizontality. Yeah. There's no, there's you know, no mistaking that. There's no mistaking it, and yeah. it's really fabulous when you get up to the top. The, the, the again, like Puy C, this is a town that uh, was uh, in favor of the Qatar was taken over uh, by the French army and Stinking then French. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then and then made into a very very big uh, stronghold for the, for Louis the Thirteenth and people like that afterwards in the 1600s, and became a major Protestant stronghold. It's very interesting. I think this whole region, uh, which is really north of, of, of Toulouse, was filled because it had lots of forest, and uh, a lot of tradespeople who had become Protestant. It was places where people hid people, where they protected them. And then, of course, at the end of the War of Religions, most of these areas were forced to go back to the the Catholic religion, and they would build a new church to make sure everybody remembered that it was now no longer Protestant, but it was Catholic. But it's it's really between the castle up above and the layout and the houses. It's it's really magic, and hopefully that is where we will have our lunch. Very nice. And then we have. A big other place to go to, and then maybe, depending on how much time, another quick stop at another one of these little villages perched up on top uh, of the rock, because we're going to be following the road that is gorgeous, that follows the River Aveyron, and so we will be down at the bottom of the gorge, gorge or gorges, and you'll see the cliffs uh, coming around as we drive in this area, and there's another small village called Penne, Penne, Penne. 
Um, P-E-N-N-E. P-E-N-N-E. And if we have time, we will make a quick stop there because, again, it's one of these incredibly impressive places high up, up, yeah, up above. Yeah, gorgeous, yep. And was also started in the 6th century by uh, the creation of an abbey. Uh, mm. There was a monastery because, if you can imagine, 1,400 years ago, uh, at, at that time, when people made monasteries, it was to go off and be as far away from civilization as possible. And you can understand even today that this is a place <laughs> that could be really far from civilization. You know, you won't ever see the ice cream man come by here. Never, <laughs> ever, 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 you know, Never, just not it. happen. Forget but, it. <laughs> and so our last stop, which is the, which is, uh, the bigger, the biggest of the three actually is, um, a town that is uh, fairly well known in France called saint Ant. Saint-Antonin Noble Val. Yes, Saint-Antonin Noble Val. Yeah. And Saint-Antonin Noble Val is actually in another department because uh, uh, Puisselcy is in uh, the, the uh, let me see Tam. if I get this right, uh, in the Tarn. And Brunichel and uh, Saint-Antonin Noble Val are in the Tarn and Garonne. Uh, yeah, Tarn and Garonne. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay. it's almost the same. Well, it's, it's really, it's really, uh, and uh, this is down below. This is what, this is interesting. Now, unlike the other two, this is not up above. This is in the bottom of a valley. Yeah. You have to drive down. You circle around to go down, and yep. it's, it's it's where uh, two uh, different rivers join up. So that was the focus of of the uh, activity that was around the river, and because it's in the valley, it was able as old as it is because it is indeed as old as the others. In fact, it became very wealthy in the eleven hundreds. But because it had more accessible land, it became much bigger. And it is to this day much bigger because uh, its permanent population is uh, almost 3,000, which is fairly big. Yeah, yeah. It's a really big town. Yeah, and I've been, and it's very nice. And it's very nice. And that one's pretty flat. I mean, that it's one... It's pretty flat. Yeah. Right. It's, you have this nice downtown kind of walking tour right. that they that the, that the tourist office recommends that right. we're probably going to do because it's right. a we'll really it. good one. Well, we'll do it with me. Yes. And... Uh, and and you just walk around and right. it's, it's, very it's fabulous. Fun. Yeah. And it's it, because beautiful. it is beautiful. flat because of the valley. So it's famous. It's famous for, it sounds like I'm repeating myself because I guess I am, uh, <laughs> be, because it is, but truthfully, even more than cord, it has in all of France, the largest number of preserved homes from the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th century. Wow. And it has the oldest city hall in France made out of beautiful stone and the building is from the 1100s actually mm -hmm. from the 1100s it has lots of walkways it has a beautiful square it actually has a couple of different squares it also has a, a a neighborhood in the village that was where they did a lot of the tanning so you can still see some of the vestiges of where they used the waters to, to set off the, the the hides for the animals and things like that but unlike the other two it became very, very important and very, very rich in the Middle Ages, like they did. Uh, it was much, much bigger. It was also a Qatar city that was invaded and taken over by uh, the French army. But then for a couple of hundred years, it really was pretty much in abandon. Mm. And it was thanks to some artists and poets that it was rediscovered in the middle of the 19th century. Oh, wow. Wow in the middle of a kind of very big romantic movement and there were various poets and artists were looking to go to the countryside to find places where they could settle. And so there were a whole group of French artists and poets who went there and they decided that it was a really beautiful place to live. And what has happened is, this is true in a couple of other places as well, they brought other artists and writers to Saint-Antonin Nobleval and so it was started in the middle of the 19th century that they actually started fixing up some of these old houses, thankfully, mm. not tearing them down. But fixing, yeah. But fixing them up because this is filled with magnificent homes with, you know, Gothic arches in the windows and Renaissance mansions with uh, beautiful stone and sculpted pieces on them. I mean, it's absolutely fabulous to see. It would be a shame to tear that down. It would be a shame. But renovating places like that is such a bear. I know people who do this. Yeah. And it's really hard to do. It's hard to do. Yeah. yeah. Because you can't put something brand new that you, you can't go to the hardware store and buy, 
you know, like you need a piece of lumber. Well, right. if you put a brand new piece of lumber in a house that's 800 years right. old or whatever, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to go find an old, an piece, old piece of, of wood. lumber. That's right. And sometimes it takes years to find the right piece of yeah. lumber. And it, it's just, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. You know, yeah. I mean, a lot of people do restoration work. And they try and age the wood so mm-hmm. it looks like the old wood. But you're absolutely right. I mean, that's one of the things My about My brother, when he fixed up things. his house, he just waited he for just the waited, right huh? beam. He needed to replace a big old beam. Huh. And it took him a good 10 years to find the beam. It's kind and of then, nice and patient. Yeah, yeah, and when somebody said, oh, I know about this beam, this place, but it, somebody needs to go dig right. it up from like the bottom of a ravine or whatever. Right. I can't remember where he got it. But he went and got it. He went and got it, huh? Yeah, yeah. And you just gotta... You don't pay money for it. You just have to wait for the right opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it is... So, so. and just one last thing. It's a little anecdote. Um, I don't know how many people out there have seen a movie that was a recent movie with Helen Mirren called The 100 Foot Journey, okay. uh, which is based on a very, very wonderful little book about a young Indian man who becomes a top-notch chef. Ah, uh, and I actually saw the movie first and then read the book afterwards. But the movie is filmed in saint antonin noble Oh, I think I've seen it. Okay, I've seen and the movie. She plays uh, the the uh, owner and the chef of a, a famous restaurant. The French one. The French one. And uh, is I think she's supposed to have one... A Michelin star or two and wants the third one, something like that. Yeah. And along comes this Indian family and moves into the house across the way and they set up a restaurant that's an Indian restaurant. <laughs> and then in the story, what happens is when she realizes after a certain amount of time that the young son is a gifted, very talented chef, she takes him under her wing and he learns how to become a French chef. Yeah. And uh, the film, uh, the, the film was made... In uh, saint antonin noble Well, some of it, because I tried to find the... Okay, so the, the movie opens with the right. street, whatever, and right. I tried to find... I'm like, I don't have any idea where they filmed that. It's, I guess, one of the streets leading out of the village, actually, you know? Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. But the rest of it, you right. can... Yeah. And it's a very... The, the thing about saint antonin noble is it's it's much more well-known than either puy or oh, Bruno yeah. Kel. Oh, yeah. It's known outside of just the local region, and so it has a huge number of people who come there in the summertime. Just to visit, yeah. To visit. It has, oh, even in September when we go, it's going to be It has lots of and lots of shops, lots of, you know, hotels, uh, much, lots and lots. I mean, Some, compared yeah, to the yeah, others yeah. where they have one or two, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very popular. Lots of foreigners who spend a part of their summer there. has a couple of very, very good music festivals in the, in the uh, summertime as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's a fabulous... It's, what we're going to do is basically do uh, a day's tour of the medieval riches of these gorgeous villages in, in the southwest area near, yeah. near Toulouse. Yeah, yeah. And it will be a wonderful day. Yes, it'll be a wonderful day. And then at the end of all that, I'll take you back to your wonderful Toulousaine uh, dwelling. And it's very comfortable. And it's very comfortable. With a pool and the apéro and all that. And so, all woo. that. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. So to see about uh, this tour and to see all the details, go to addictedtofrance.com forward slash tours. And it'll all be there for you. All of it. Yeah. Elise, are you done? I think so. <laughs> I want to go now. Yes, we need to go soon. I might try and go before the, we do the tour to see if I can find a way back up. In a uh, in a uh, puissance, yeah, I will. Puissance, you will. Puissance, oh, it's, 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 br- it's Brunekel. It's, it's Brunekel. Yeah. Brunekel, no, mm. nah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right, everybody. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you very soon next week, probably. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thanks for listening to the show. To find out about tours offered by Elise and I, visit addictedtofrance.com. Please subscribe to the Join Us in France email list. It only goes out about once a month, but it is where you'll find out about our most recent episodes, and you'll also be the first to hear about promos we are running on the tours and anything else new we're cooking up. 
I invite you to look up the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook, a great place for folks who know a ton about France, exchange tips with those who are just starting to look into visiting France. A bientôt! Thank you.